Welcome to the Story A Day podcast. This is Julie Duffy, encouraging you to be a writer today, not someday. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Julie Duffy from the Story A Day podcast here, and I'm delighted to have a guest today. It's Angela Ackerman. She's a writing coach, international speaker, and a firm believer that writers succeed best together. Perhaps best known in the writing community as the host of Writers Helping Writers and co-author of the Emotion Thesaurus series of writing reference books with Becca Puglisi. She also has the One Stop Writers uh, web app packed with unique tools and resources to save you time as you plan research and Right. But most importantly, of course, Angela's been helping writers for a long time and giving me prompts for write for story a day challenges for years. So thank you, Angela. It is lovely to finally meet you. Yeah, absolutely. It is nice to, you know, finally see a real person instead of just an avatar we were talking about earlier. So we're going to get, I'm going to get into serious writerly questions in a moment, but I wanted to ask you, first of all, what kind of kid were you? Like, where would I have found little Angela on a Saturday afternoon? Hmm. Probably doing something mischievous because oh. I was kind of a handful. I was definitely an outdoor kid. So you would have found me outside. I might have actually taken a bunch of books and a blanket and climbed up onto the roof of my shed so that I could read in peace and quiet or go out to my fort and be alone and, and, you know, make up all these scenarios of me living there in, in this little tree house of mine. So yeah, probably something like that. I was on my own a lot and I like to read and I like to use my imagination. Yeah. It's always interesting to, to find out, you know, I, I occasionally run across people who were surprised by their urge to write later in life. But I would say the majority of people I meet in this world are are that, you know, like, oh yeah, I was under the covers with a book and I was, you know, trying to get, not have to go out to play with other people so I could keep reading. So thank you for sharing that. So one of the reasons I asked you on the podcast this week is you wrote a fabulous article this week called Why Writers Should Do NaNoWriMo in 2020. And the opening line is a classic, I think, for the ages. You open with, let's not mince words, 2020 has been a real crap sandwich. So <laughs> tell me about, a little bit about that and, and the response you've heard from people. Well, I just, I had written an article maybe a few weeks earlier talking about the psychological shift that we have when the seasons change to fall. And, you know, there's a lot of symbolism behind the fall, the season of autumn, you know, it's kind of this mode that we get in where we're preparing, you know, we're kind of trying to clear the decks and get things ready. And it's almost like there's this, this push to, to, to a burst of energy, renewed sense of energy to get stuff done. And so I was, I was trying to say in that article that, you know, this is a really good time for us to sort of turn the page and, you know, it's just been an awful year. And if, you know, it is a good time to think about what can I salvage out of the year, you know, my goals, you know, maybe a lot of them were sidelined, a lot of things that I hoped to get done, I couldn't get done. I wasn't in the mindset to create because, you know, of all the stress everyone's been dealing with this year. And so this article was really just an extension of that, because I see uh, Nano as such a fantastic opportunity to sort of, you know, walk the walk. A lot of people, they... They were working on a novel when COVID hit and then just the, the crushing stress and worry and anxiety and everything that sort of hit them, it, it's, it caused them to stumble in the story that they're in. And they sort of felt like I couldn't, you know, pick up on, you know, I can't pick up on that particular story. So NaNo is a good opportunity if you want to do a new project, if you kind of want to sideline that and just do something new, do something for you experiment a little bit, you know, play, because I think mm -hmm. as writers, we tend to get very focused. We don't want to waste time. We want to make sure that, you know, everything we're doing, it's, you know, it's, 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 we have a certain timetable mentally in our heads and, and, you know, we want to make sure that everything is lining up and Nano is this great opportunity to just kind of take a breath from the, from the pressure that we put on ourselves and just enjoy the creative process. And I think right now, especially a lot of people could use that. They could use an event like Nano to sort of give them permission 
to just get in touch with that creative side again and focus on something good. So one of the things that surprises me occasionally because I've just been in this world for so long is that that people haven't necessarily heard of NaNoWriMo. Mm-hmm. So it occurs to me, we should probably talk about what it is. So do you want to give people a little um, summary of what it is and what it's really meant to do? Not that they're strict with rules, but, you know, what the ideas behind it, as, as you understand it, are. Yeah. So NaNo is uh, National Novel Writing Month. And it's basically a challenge where people all over the world decide that in November, they're going to try to write 50,000 words. And for many people, that's a full novel. For other people, it's not quite a full novel, but it's a big chunk of what will become a novel. And I think that it is just, you know, a, a really good challenge where you're encouraged to kind of lock your internal editor and all the voices in your head telling you that you can't do it and that you're a terrible writer. And what are you thinking, even considering writing a novel? There's no way you can do that. And you kind of take that person and you shove them in this virtual room with like creepy clowns and you just leave them there for a month. And you just give yourself over to the process of creating and enjoying creating and letting your mind go on tangents and there's definitely, you know, a wide range of people who are plotters versus plant pantsers, people who just like, they just go into it. They don't know what they're going to write, but they just start going and, and they really let the floodgates open on their creativity. Other people like to go in with a plan. You know, they definitely have the goal of having something, you know, usable at the end of the month. And there is no right or wrong way to do this challenge. It's just really about this camaraderie between all these people that, you know, we're all passionate about writing, we're all passionate about storytelling and creating. And this gives us an opportunity, like I say, to sort of push all the other stressors of life aside and make this a priority and and do something really cool. So yeah, because I sometimes get worried about people who are like, I'm going to use Nano to finish my novel. I'm like, ah, well, you know, because what you were talking about before about this sense of play, I think is Mm -hmm. like the biggest gift of a challenge like this that that locking the editor in the room with the creepy clowns like you said is uh, is like that now you went through in your article you have five points that you made about why on earth on top of all of the other stressors we have this year we should commit to writing 50,000 words in a month but you make a good point so I liked uh, like your, your number one point was about n- normality and routine mm. But then you talk very quickly also about share, a shared common goal. So I don't know if you want to like talk a little bit about those two together and why, why you think they're important. Well, I mean, I think everybody's routine has been completely upended. There's a lot of people who are parents. And so especially at the first lockdown, they were, you know, they were homeschooling. So some of them had a day job and they were homeschooling and they were trying to write. And, you know, if they are a parent... They're also trying really hard to keep everybody in the house psychologically sound, you know, trying to, you know, be the rock for everybody. And that takes a toll, too. I think as as parents, it takes a toll to, you know, try to make things as normal as possible and try to be there emotionally for everyone. And sometimes we put ourselves last. And, you know, the routine of of, of doing this challenge, it, it, it prioritizes something that's really important to us writers. And so I think that that and just knowing that you've got 50,000 words to write, you've got a month to do it, it does pull you back into a routine, especially for people who have done this challenge before. A lot of people, you know, they they get hooked, you do the first one, and that's it, you have to come back every year, it's you just love it. And, you know, a lot of people were reconsidering, you know, should I do it? How am I ever going to make time for this? I've got so many other things. And, and that's a problem, right? Like, obviously, a lot of people have more on their plate, they have less support. But it does offer that sense of normality. So that one is kind of really important. And I think to, you know, the second half where, you know, you have all these people that are kind of in the same boat, you know, they all have extra burdens and mental loads to carry. And I think there's just something special about coming together and all, you know, taking on this challenge together in good times or bad times. I just think it's really special. So that was interesting that you said that, you know, it's 50,000 words and, and it feels like this year in particular, having someone define something for you, <laughs> like we know what this looks like, yeah. uh, we know what's expected of us, let's just get our heads down and do this for a month is quite appealing. Yes, yes, 
<laughs> I agree. Cause everything, ha- everything has been uncertain and there's been no ways to color within the lines this year. Like there hasn't, everything is, is new and we're adapting and we're trying to roll with the punches. So yeah. Yeah, I agree. Now you talked about, you know, uh, this as free therapy and you use the word resilience, which is, you know, a bit of a buzzword at the moment, but I think it's, it is really powerful when we can show ourselves what we're capable of. And I think, I mean, that's one of the reasons I started a challenge was because, you know, it's, it's sort of easy to let ourselves off the hook for all kinds of reasons, some of which you just talked about. What have you discovered about taking on this challenge? And first of all, I, I should ask, have you actually done an arrival? Or are oh, you yeah, just I've done it. I haven't done it in a, in, a, in a, quite a few years because I just, it it no longer worked with my schedule. And then, you know, Beck and I are, are you know, focusing more on nonfiction and, and we have one stop for writers now. And so there's just, unfortunately, it's it's not something that I can work into my schedule, but absolutely I have done it. And, and I'm one of those people where I tried it once and I was hooked. And for me, the first time I did it, I didn't think I could write a novel. I thought that, you know, I could only write short pieces, you know, short stories, picture books, things like that. And the first time I did it, it was like, oh my gosh, I can do this. I can actually write novels. And after that, I was hooked. Like, then it's like, okay, I want to write the next novel and the next novel. But as far as, you know, free therapy and, and resilience, I mean, I think that one thing that appeals to us when we write is that we put a lot of ourselves into the story. We put a lot of ourselves into the characters and it's a safe way to sort of explore different ideas and stuff like that. And I think that, you know, this past year has left us with a lot of negative, difficult emotions. And I think it can be kind of free therapy to sort of explore some of those onto the page using what we know, writing what we know can be really powerful and, you know, it can be really helpful to us. So I think that, you know, it is kind of free therapy, that it is something that's, you know, a way of processing everything that we've kind of gone through. Have you found it easier to tackle the nonfiction books, which we will get on to talk about in a minute, having had that experience of like, oh my goodness, I can write an actual long (laughs) story, not a novel. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of daunting. Like the first, it sounds crazy to people who have been writing novels forever, but you have to kind of remember back to that first time you attempted a novel and it was daunting. You're just, you know, it's, you look at it, you look at all the words, you're like, there's no way I can do that. There's no way I can come up with an idea that's that sustainable, that is going to last through the entire novel. And, and yet we can, we're all capable of it. And uh, yeah, so I think that it, it really does, you know, reaffirm that each one of us are capable of doing it. Each one of us is capable of longer works. And for me, I mean, fiction has always fueled the, the immersive effect of reading fiction has always fueled my interest in understanding story and how story works and understanding characters and understanding where characters meet the real world. So how psychology real human behavior and why we do the things we do, how that filters down into our characters and our characters' behavior and how readers, you know, read a story, not just to be entertained, but also to have an opportunity to experience things that are unfamiliar, but also familiar to them. You know, the, the, the situations may be unfamiliar, but the feelings, the emotions, the uncertainty, the sense of failure, whatever the character's feeling, those are all things that the reader has felt as well. And I've always been really, the two for me have kind of, I don't know, blended together. I I just, I really love learning about storytelling and about how they blend and then sharing that through the books that I write. So yeah, definitely the two have come together. Thinking about that resilience and about that, what we can learn from doing it, there is a danger because it's a massive challenge. It's a massive thing to set yourself up for. And there's always a danger that people will be too hard on themselves if they don't make it or, you know, if, if they f- so-called fail. But I, I, I really like, loved your reason five for that people should participate is because the world needs your words, which is one of my mm-hmm. favorite things to say to writers is, you know, like that the world needs your stories. And so you, you have a little like pep talk for people at the end about, you know, if they don't really want to do NaNoWriMo, what else they should do? Yes. So 
I do. It, there's definitely, a, you know, it is possible that people may feel like they're a failure if they don't complete um, the challenge. But the way I look at it is every new word is a word you didn't have before. So every new word is a victory. And no matter how far you get in the challenge, you had the courage to start. You had the courage to try. And a lot of people don't. Like a lot of people talk about writing or they talk about writing a story or they talk about writing a novel, but they don't actually do it. And so even starting that and even, you know, putting however many words on the page that you get, I think to me, you should be proud of that and use it to inspire you to keep moving forward. You know, if you don't make it one year, you know, either decide to take on the challenge again or figure out how you can be, how you can make sure that you finish a novel another time a year, like try to understand what prevented you from finishing. I think that one thing that holds people up is that they don't plan enough at the start. I think that, you know, people can, unfortunately, I know, I know pantsers, they just like to go in and, and, and go for it. And I'm talking as a reform pantser, I used to pants, but I also believe that the more we understand about our characters' motivations, the easier the story will be to write and the easier it is for us to not get stuck in the middle because we always understand what's driving our character, what's pushing them towards a certain goal. So planning a little bit more can be very, very helpful to, to making sure that you don't, you know, lose steam partially through. But like I said, even if you do, still take it as a victory. Now, as far as things that people can do, if you're not in the mindset to, to take on a challenge like this, you know, there's always ways that we can be, you know, pushing ourselves forward. Not everybody feels super creative. Not, not everyone is kind of in the mindset where, you know, they're ready to write. And so, you know, I kind of encourage people to, you know, do, do research on the next story that they want to, you know, either a story that they're working on now, you know, what kind of research can they do that's going to put them in a place where when they go to pick up that writing again, it's going to make them more successful. They're going to be able to slip into that story better because they're going to understand the character better maybe or understand, you know, where things are going. Can they just play around with ideas? Can they, you know, just take care of themselves and fill that creative well? Because I think that's another big piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. is a lot of people don't feel creative right now. So looking at ways where, you know, we can do things that, that fill that well, whether it's read books play with different ideas, you know, get out in nature, just take care of ourselves. Yeah. It's been a trying year. Like there's a lot of things that we can do that maybe aren't writing, but are yeah. other things that can further that creative spirit or even shift it towards the business side. If you're, if you want to take a break completely and you want to look at marketing or you want to look at platform and you want to, you know, start doing research in those areas. Like there's always things that we can do to kind of further our career. And that's where I paused my conversation with Angela, but we went on to talk about much, much more, including the uh, writer um, emotion thesaurus tools that she and her partner Becca Polisi have been putting together for, I think, the past eight years. And that it, conversation is coming up in one of the upcoming episodes of this podcast. In the meantime, I hope that we have encouraged you to either dive into NaNoWriMo with abandon or come up with another plan for November that's going to use all that writerly energy that's swirling around in the air and do either choice with joy. I'll be back soon and of course keep writing. Thanks for listening. Why not come over to the blog at storyaday.org and check out this week's writing prompts and articles. And in the meantime, have a great creative week and of course, keep writing.